Hello and welcome to this new video series. We are going to talk about crafting interpreters in Swift. In this series, I want to explain how I implemented the SLOX interpreter in Swift. This comes from this amazing book called Crafter Interpreters, which explains from scratch how to make an interpreter in a made-up language, uh, a good language, like a real language. It's not something small or anything like that. It can run any anything you pretty much want to do. Like you have functions, you have classes, you have even closures. There is everything you need or you everything you think about about a programming language is probably in here. Obviously, there are a lot of extensions that one could do, but this is not any any small thing it's an actual real language this book is made by the amazing bob i started working on this book like last year the beginning at the beginning of 2017 in this post that you can find on my website i basically explained what was my goal one of the main goals that i was was to actually finish it i usually start projects but i rarely finish them by having a book that was being written as I was implementing the, the the language and the interpreter, I thought it would be easier for me to follow the book closely and and basically write as close as possible code as was as was the book was showing. The book is written in Java, so write, writing it in Swift is not that different. Obviously, Swift can do a lot of of different things. You can have a different style of coding. But for this, I just try to keep as close as possible to the book with the goal of not diverging too much and feeling lost at some point, as I'm not an expert on this. So I didn't want to feel lost and like abandon the project. I wanted to actually finish it. And I'm really happy to say that the project has been finished as the book was finally written by the end of the 2017. I actually finished it like in the beginning of, of 2018. I uh, didn't work on it on Christmas. But now I can say the Lux Swift Interpreter, it's finished. It does everything the book explains, even with some extra challenges that the book mentions. Obviously, as I, as I explained in this blog post, there are a lot of things that could be improved. There are probably bugs that I haven't found, but at least the, I run all the tests that the, the original project has. The project is pretty much functional. I mentioned here some of the things that I would like to improve, like uh, I messed up a little with the, with the error system. I was not really happy with the Swift error system, so I diverged a little from there and I ended up regretting it. There are other stuff that I would like to stop using any for a lot of the internal types of the interpreter because it, it ended up being a mess with with the optional handling on Swift. In the other side, I'm pretty happy how the project structure is working, how and how little effort I had to put to actually solve any crazy th things. I don't think I spend a lot of time uh, looking for solutions for crazy stuff that I put myself in. I was literally like following the book. So now that the Swift interpreter has been finished, I would like to record a series of videos going through the interpreter, my implementation of it, and show you like a little of the code. It's basically I want to give you a walkthrough through the the code itself and how it works and some ideas I had and some of the challenges I work how I had to overcome. It's really important to clarify that this is not a tutorial on how to do interpreters in Swift or anything like that. Maybe that comes in the future, but I'm not an expert enough to do that. So if you actually are interested in it. I really recommend you to read the book. It's a free book. You can just go online and read it and it will explain you everything you need to know to do what I did. And I'm pretty sure that with some experience, you can do anything like even better than what I did. Who am I? So as I said, I'm Alejandro Martinez. I'm an iOS developer. I'm really, really interested in programming languages. I follow like a lot of the programming language development, like the Swift evolution list. I'm always there when there is some like geek stuff they are discussing about on the on the compiler. Uh, but that said, I have no clue about what I'm doing. So I'm not an expert on this. I haven't worked on anything serious. Uh, and apart from that, I follow a lot like the development of other programming languages like Rust, like Jonathan Blow's J and all that kind of stuff. Things that if you follow me, you already noticed because I'm bombarding Twitter with, with that kind of stuff. 
let's take a look at what's my plan for the series. So the first part is going to be a project introduction, which is this video, but we are going to go and take a look at the, at the structure of the project, how I have like some, some scripts around it. We're going to take a look at that part that it's not the, the interpreter itself. It's more like a, in a meta level what we are, we are doing with it. Then in the second video, I will take a look at the scanner, show you how how we convert a string, a list of characters into tokens that then we can fit into the parser. In the third video, I'm going to go through the parser itself and how it gathers all this all this token information to then create the, the statements and expressions which will form our abstract syntax tree. The fourth part is about the semantic analysis. We're going to talk about the resolver class, which deals with preparing a little bit the data structure that then the interpreter is going to run because there are some things that we need to pre-process before the interpreter can actually can actually run them. The last part is going to is going to be talking about the interpreter itself and how it runs the code at runtime, how it figures out what it has to run and where it needs to go through to get the code and all that kind of stuff. So this is my original idea about what this series is going to go but expect some changes and a slight difference from this roadmap because probably it's going to be changing depending on how things are going. So let's take a look at the code itself, at the project itself, like it's about time that we start. So the, the project can be found uh, on my GitHub, everything is open source, so if you want to take a look at the code itself, you can just pull this project and everything is here. I have here a summary of basically the, the chapters of the book, and which parts are done, especially on the challenges, like obviously the, the parts in the book are completed, but the challenges. So you can, if you are curious about something that it's not part of the, of the explanations of the book, you can always check here and see, oh, it's part of the challenge. So that's why it's not explained. I explain how to run the test, which we're going to talk about, and the project structure here. If you pull this project, you're going to find this folder. The first thing to realize is that this project uses the Swift package manager. Uh, as I've talked before in a previous video, I'm a really fan of it. I, I hope that the future is basically full Swift package manager for everything we need to do because I, I really love and the work that has been put in other package managers, for the, especially for the iOS community. It's huge and I'm really thankful for that. But I think that we should all aim to focus our efforts into a single piece of, of software. Apart from this, you have things like the Swift format, which is a, a project that I love that helps me like format my code without even thinking. I really hate losing time on this kind of stuff, so I just build and automatically formats everything for me. And then I have the make file that we're going to talk about now because it's something that it's how I interact with the project, how I run everything, how I run the test, how I compile it. Everything is done through this. And then some tests and some extra tools that we are going to take a look. One of the interesting files you're going to find here is this temp test logs file. This is where I write like random code, random programs, things that uh, should work, things that shouldn't work. When I don't understand something, I just write it here and with a breakpoint and an Xcode, I can take a look and see my understanding, what is my mistake or how can I fix it. So I've just been dropping and dropping here code since the beginning. So you can you will find like many commented stuff that but for example I have here the last piece of code that I, I wrote for here. You can ha you can see that we have classes with even initializers. This is obviously a dynamic language. So you can just here declare a new a new field, a new property on the class, assign a default value. You can have functions that accept like this this object, this instance, and then you can even print it. You can here concatenate the strings with a plus operator, then you can create an instance and call this method, this function with this instance. Typical stuff that a real programming language does. So as I said before, this is not uh, like a calculator with, with some operators and that's it. No, no, this is a real programming language. To be honest, you start doing a calculator, which is really fun, but it helps making all the pipeline scanner, the parser, the interpreter, once you have that pipeline done, you can start growing the language and you can get here. Just to show you how it runs, what I usually do, this is Xcode. So if you are not used to developing on Mac or for iOS or Apple related platforms, well, this is the IDE we usually use. This is the IDE that you use 
eight hours a day. So it's the one I wanted to use to develop this. I could have used other things, but I, I'm really comfortable with this. So what I do is I have a, a scheme with some arguments that tell me what file to run. Uh, and here I, I have this set up for when a test, when I run the test and some test fails, I just come here and I wrote the, the path to the file and I run this one instead of the, the temp test logs and I can debug the issue and, and fix it more quickly. So if you want to see what happens if we run that program that I showed you, you already saw it there. So it basically, it says cooking food apple because basically it's what this is done. So it runs cooking food and the name of the food you pass, that which comes from here, which by default is this. We could, for example, take a look and see how we can name this, give it another name like banana banana and save the file. And if now we run it, it will actually say cooking food banana, like the minions. So the project structure, it's basically separated in these three modules. What you see here is the way I like to set up projects in Swift, especially when they are like command line applications. The way I do it is basically I have this S logs, which is the main program. This is the command line that you run, which literally it does nothing but grabbing the arguments that you pass in, doing some checks, and then deciding what to run from the main logs core application. So in this case, we can run the logs as a, as a normal interpreter running the, the files from a path that it has been given, or we can just run it without any arguments and the, and the prompt keeps in, and then you can start doing stuff in the prompt like as a, a rebel. So you can see here that if we run the S logs without any argument, we have here a rebel environment, which we can play with. So we can do things like defining variables, printing them, and even define like classes and like everything the you can do in a file, you should be able to do it here. Now, the log score, which is where all the code lives, it's basically what we're gonna be taking a look in the upcoming videos. But just to show you how everything it starts, we have the the interface that is exposed to the other module, like the command line module, which accepts just a file and it checks if it has any errors or whatever, and it just runs it. We can do the same with the prompt. Here you have what I just showed you. And the main idea here is that you have this run function, which does everything. This is the core of the interpreter. Here you can see clearly the different steps that the interpreter has from scanning, then goes to parsing, and then it goes to doing some resolving, like static analysis, and then it runs the interpreter. This is the, the classes and the code that we're gonna be taking a look in the next videos. Now, apart from the Swift code, I also have this make file that helps me manage the project itself. I have basically a fetch that does all the Swift package manager updating of the libraries. Then I have like a build step which obviously like, you can see that if I didn't have this, I would have to write all these parameters, which I never remember. So it's much easier to just have like an automation script to do this. I have the AST code generation, which is a crucial part of the project because this is what generates the AST nodes from a text representation. We're gonna take a look now. Then as I said, I have the, the formatter, which it literally just runs the format with some ignoring some rules that I don't like. And the test command makes sure that everything we do follows at least what the test of the original project have. And then some other stuff to clean the, pro the build folder and basically generate this Xcode project on the fly. Because it's the, this is how the Swift Package Manager works. You define the project structure here, and from this, then you generate on the fly uh, Xcode project to work with. In terms of dependencies, the only dependency I have for this project is the result type, because it's not part of the standard library. You can see here that we have two executables, like the slogs, the main interpreter, the command line, and then we have this generate AST that I'm gonna show you now. And basically for that, you define the three targets. This part is what I was talking about, that usually all my projects are defined in this way, with the main the main core which contains everything all the all the code that you need for the project and then just a thin layer on top 
for the command line in interface. With this, it has allowed me to do things like run a Swift server with, with that provides a web page. And with, an, with a small API, you can actually write logs code online and have it run by the server thanks to this because I it, I have in another branch you can just create another target that uses this logs code as a library and then you can just implement the, the server in there which is really really nice it's a really nice way to structure the project so let's take a look at what this generate AST does basically what we have here is a, a textual representation of the AST that we need the all the the expressions and here we have all the statements this is everything that the language needs to represent a program what we do here is basically just define the name in this case of the expression and this is defining the constructor and the, and the properties that it needs the syntax here is a slightly different from the one that you find in the book with these two things defined we have this printer here that basically just creates all the all the files that we need for this. We can take a look at the, for example, at the expression, and you can see that code that can be generated by the machine. We have here the visit the visitor pattern with everything that with all the expressions all, with a function for each expression that the that we support, and then we have here the the class expression with the, all the subclasses namespace inside this one because this file is generated by the machine. It's a file that you shouldn't change at all. For example, if I do, when I go and generate again the AST, the file is just gonna be overwritten completely. And here you can see that the code that we wrote seconds ago, it's gone. So this happens also for the, the statements. You can see it's a similar structure. The last important part of the project structure is the test. What I did was grab the test from the original project, which come with this Python script that runs them, and the tests themselves are written and, and grouped by functionality here. The interesting thing here is how these tests work. The way it works is basically by analyzing the output of the program in the in the standard output. For example, here you can see how we are printing the true equals true. This is going to result in in printing true to the console. What this what this Python script does is it reads here what is the expected output in this case true, and it makes sure that that's what you match. We can take a look at another more complex example. Here is we are testing that the initializers receive the proper arguments and that they are called and here you can see how it's expecting in it to be printed because this line is going to print in it. So that means that this call into the into a class is running that initializer. So what I did here is basically just tweak it a little. You can see that each chapter has defined the test that it needs to run because obviously the, the interpreter is built chapter by chapter. So you cannot run the the whole suite of tests in the first chapter because you don't have anything and then again thanks to make i can just do make test and this compiles the project and it runs the tests that i defined as the current supported tests and you can see that all the tests that are assigned to the chapter 13 which is the last chapter are passing with my implementation which doesn't mean that it doesn't have any bug, but at least it means that at least you have some confidence that it follows the original implementation as close as possible. And with this, we have come to the end of this first episode. I hope that you get now like an understanding of the project structure and that you're excited to take a look at the next episode and see how we're converting the string representation of the program into some tokens so then we can feed it into the next step. That's it for today. Stay tuned for the next episode and see you later.